And okay. hang on, I'm going to share my screen. Thanks for coming. We were expecting crowds, so we have crowds and crowds of cookies and muffins and snacks. And it's the season. <laughs> well, some of it. So thank you for coming. We're going to have a pretty tight agenda tonight. So we're going to have, um, I think instead of doing introductions now, we will wait until people have an opportunity for their comments and then they can introduce themselves here. So, um, Kimberly's going to be helping us out, and she is masterful at helping groups figure out how to work together. So, she's come up with some ground rules. So, on the table over where the agendas are, there are ground rules there, and we would like to have everyone kind of follow along. And just the most important part about the ground rules is that we're really trying to ensure that everybody gets to say something in accordance to the discussion that needs to happen as far as whether or not the Fire and the Rip Council is in support of the CWPP as proposed, or if you as a group are not going to vote that way and uh, are not in support of it as it's proposed. So we're going to start with that. One of the things that we obviously all of us are here on time. The other big thing is hopefully this will, this is a, the time that everybody should have read the document. Like there's not going to be a lot of going back into the document piece by piece because we're hoping that everybody came prepared tonight that had, we had about a month to kind of review it. Hopefully some of you all went to the commission meeting on the 21st. We will have a little bit of an update from Andrew at some point before we get into the discussion period of that, but we're going to go through each of these ground rules individually. If we have any questions, we can certainly ask those questions during this uh, run through of these rules. We can also add some. If there's a rule that isn't on this list, again, it's not a comprehensive list. It's just to help us really come to that conclusion, be able for those of you that are voting members of the council to say, yep, we like the CWPP or nope, we don't want to sign fire in the rip council for that. So rule, ground, ground rule number one for our commitment is to arrive on time and be prepared for topic discussion. Expect to participate and assume people have good intentions and are doing their best. Prepare to focus and listen. This is a public discussion, not a debate. The purpose is not to win an argument, but to hear many points of view and explore many options and solutions. Everyone is encouraged to participate. You may be asked to share what you think, or we may ask for comments from those who haven't spoken. It is always okay to pass when you are asked to share a comment. We encourage the use of I statements in order to decrease common stereotypes. We ask everyone to use I statements and speak only for yourself and from your experiences. This will help us to limit any tendencies to generalize individual comments to entire groups. Each comment and discussion point will be limited to five minutes, uninterrupted. No one or two individuals should dominate a discussion. If you have already voiced your ideas, let others have an opportunity when you speak. Be brief and to the point. One person will speak at a time, refrain from side conversations, pay attention to the person speaking. If you think you will forget an idea that comes to mind, definitely write it down, jot it down. Listen to and respect other points of view. Respect the comments and discussion shared. It is okay to disagree respectfully. Avoid put downs and try to show support. Allow space so that only one person is speaking at any given time. In some cases, as with any groups, we may have to come to the agreements to agree to disagree. There is always an option to come to an agreement, so arguing can stop and move on. So there may be that point. And obviously tonight there's going to be a vote in place, so that will kind of help the group kind of go forward with the decision that's made for those of you that are voting members. 
tackle issues and challenges, not one another. Use language that focuses on the objective problems while respecting other people. Do your best to understand the pros and cons of every option, not just those you prefer. Be as objective and as fair-minded as you can be. Seek first to understand and not to be understood. When time allows and is appropriate, ask questions to seek clarification when you don't understand the meaning of someone's comments. Take risks where appropriate. We ask that you contribute to discussions by sharing your thoughts, feelings, and experiences. Sometimes this may involve personal discomfort and risk taking. It is up to you at the degree of which you decide to take that risk. Confidentiality is critical for council cohesion and trust. It is important that we are able to discuss council business in a safe environment. As such, people must feel a level of trust and support. To develop this safe environment, we ask that whatever is shared during the discussion stays within its confines. We will also have a parking lot, so if there are things that need to be on the parking lot, Kristen is there taking that note. The parking lot is a place where participants can park off topic ideas, questions, or comments for a later time to keep the meeting on track and on time. So with a thumbs up, can we get agreement that we all sort of understand the ground rules as presented? Excellent. Are there any additions or discussion on the ground rules as presented? Fantastic. And you all were one, great with me. Question. Go ahead. On that. So the you mentioned questions mm -hmm. to clarify things. Will that follow a five minute presentation? Yes, we're going to try to allow the person to make and their how comments. How long will those last? Mm -hmm. And dependent upon how it goes and what time is allotting, you know, like if it gets to be a super lengthy conversation about specific comments to one particular topic, we're definitely going to have to roll with that. And so I may monitor that time as case by case because I don't think that all of them will have that, but there will be that tendency. So again, so that could easily turn a five minute <laughs> oh, yes. topic into the 40. 20 minute. <laughs> So maybe tonight yes. we won't do a lot of asking questions. So, and we, Judy and I also talked about this. So we could do where everybody just gets their opportunity to present and then do the comment afterwards. If, if that's if, if we have time. time, because we we have a lot of people. I don't know mm -hmm. how many are going to speak, and we have a fuels report. So maybe we'll hold all the questions until the end. And see if really we wise. have time. Yeah, jot down your questions. And, yeah. Yeah. And we're gonna otherwise. It won't, we won't go through the yes. people. Okay. So now my thumbs up. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. You didn't want All to spend right. the night. I didn't want to spend the night. No. <laughs> okay. Let's get started with a fuels report. I, I guess it's Byron and Dave Tingman. Who's going first? Okay, I'll uh, start it out by uh, talking about the uh, Bitterroot RCD. We're a member of the field coordinating group. Um, hey, Byron, can I hold you for just a minute? Would you mind coming up here and speaking only? So I, I have a feeling it's harder. Sam, could you hear Byron okay? Give me a thumbs up, or if you'd like him to move up. Well, I hate to ask him to move up, but it would be easier to hear, but it, it's okay. up to you guys. Can you hear me now? Sure. Yeah, maybe you're good. Here. You're good. You're oh, good. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. That's all right. Okay. You can hear me now. Yep. It takes me a second to unmute, so <laughs> tolerate me. Thanks. Yeah, you're good. Okay. So I got my name in case you didn't. Uh, <laughs> is that much to say? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, our fuels committee uh, meet once or twice a month, uh, and it's a coordinated fuels committee uh, made up of the Forest Service, DNRC, uh, lots of uh, non-government organizations, 
uh, and RCND and, and several others. Uh, so, and, and Dave kind of shared that uh, view with me. So, um, I'm going to give you a little update on where we are with the RCND currently. Uh, the RCND uh, basically has probably about 20 projects going on for about uh, 300 acres at this point. Uh, and these are grant programs. These are programs that uh, uh, treat hazardous fuels on private land. Uh, and there are 75, 25 grants, most of them. Some are still 50, 50. Uh, but uh, we work with landowners basically on these 20 projects to reduce the fire risk, reduce the fuel on private land. Uh, not only in the home ignition zone, but also uh, away from the home to reduce uh, that risk in that forested environment. And uh, one of the projects that we have uh, is 51 acres up uh, uh, in Prairie Loop. Uh, and most of our projects butt right up against National Forest on this west side uh, in, the, in the Valley County. And uh, what we're trying to do is coordinate cross-boundary projects between the Forest Service and the RCMB uh, treatment of private land next to the Forest Service. So, so what, what our objective is to reduce the overall risk between all these coordination uh, entities that get together once or twice a month. And, and where are you doing your treatments? Where are we doing our treatments? And where can we marry those together in order to uh, get the best bang for our buck, uh, so to speak, okay? Um, the other thing is we've applied for several grants uh, here just recently. Uh, these grants are uh, part of the infrastructure grant, part of the uh, forest action plan uh, that the state has, the DRC, uh, and also Western states, and also one called Hazard Appeal. So we've applied for all those grants, and we're just waiting right now to see, uh, see if uh, the choice is made to put some of that money into the Valley County. Uh, Currently, uh, just to let all of you know, uh, my job is on the streets. Anybody that's interested in applying uh, can, uh, can send an application in uh, to the RCMB, and our website has that information on it in terms of how to apply and what criteria to address. Uh, and then I think uh, we're thinking about mid December. We're going to sit down and start ranking the applications. We've got 16 applications so far. Uh, we're going to rank them. Uh, we're going to involve four service, DRT, RCMB, uh, in that ranking process, and then uh, probably an interview process that we go through. And yes, I'm retired. And, uh, call it quick, that's 22 years. You're not getting canned? <laughs> no, not yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> still, still a chance, though. Right? Yeah, it's still a chance. Always a chance when you're working, right? He's yeah. still going to attend fire in the roof meetings because Bobby Byron cannot okay, be I'm going to turn it over to Dave to talk about torture. Hey, good evening. Uh, I'm Dave Tingley, veteran national force fuel specialist. I got a couple of notes to help myself out there. So in 2023, the bitter treated 16,000 acres on the National Forest, which is a big year for us. Um, achieved that through primarily prescribed fire and uh, mechanical training. In 2024, which our fiscal year is already started in 24, we have 1.2 million in Joint Chiefs funding. And that's the third year in that Joint Chiefs agreement that we have with, that we work with uh, NRCS in the world. So we will be applying to re up that agreement, that application for the year four through six, which is the year cycles. So um, that'll go in sometime next summer. Uh, so, how we're using those funds and other some other funds in 2024, we're funding work through Presence Forever that is mostly occurring on the West Fork District. 
and we are doing work in the East Fork District with another as Byron mentioned, non-governmental agreement, or uh, excuse me, non-NGOs, non-governmental organizations. So in the East Fork, we're working with mule deer to do treatments on the National Forest, and then just down the road here in Stevensville, on the west side, we're doing some work through the National Wild Turkey Federation. So those are entities that are working with the National Forest to achieve doing treatments for the purposes of producing fuels in the urban interface, which also, in their opinion, or they would partner with us, helps meet some wildlife objectives as well. So those have all been, been good partners. And not to forget, but we're also working with Valley, with Valley County Forest for Drew to do treatment as well in the National Forest. In 24, what we have planned total for acres treat, treated Again, it's a plan. We'll hopefully achieve our plan. We did last year and the year before, but it's uh, about 20,000 acres of treatment on the National Forest. So, planning a big year. Uh, again, just want to highlight that a lot of that is achieved by and large with the agreements that we've stood up with these NGOs and the Valley County and working with the DMC as well. It's all added capacity and helps achieve. Uh, impact to protect my community. Uh, maybe this is when we should have you give us an update on the CWP. Um, <clears throat> sure, yeah. I don't know how you can decide you're going to split this up. But. Yeah, I can probably uh, You've got everything that uh, I sent you everything. So sure. as far yeah. as the discussion of what's changed and what's being proposed to change sure. on the graph, you have all of that. So most folks should know um, the comments are closed on December 1st for public comment on the CWPP. Um, so recently we've been pretty much compiling all those comments, going through them one by one, and really considering what folks had input on. We also had a, a commissioner meeting um, where a few folks from Fire in the Roof and some other people from the public showed up, were able to voice their concerns in front of the commissioners. It was a, a really productive meeting, it went well. Um, the comments from the folks that did show up were received really well and taken into consideration by the commissioners also. So we've really been working with the contractor on going through those comments, um, implementing a bit of the CWPP. Hopefully we, we did put them out to the core team for review. We did not get a whole lot of feedback on some of those comments. Um, so we're kind of moving ahead with those. I don't have the list in front of me. We might have to deal with the whole. Work? So yeah, absolutely. And Ken did meet with the update team or the input team. Um, I wasn't able to make that meeting. So if you have any questions on that, I can probably update you guys on that meeting. But we basically narrowed it down to um, five comments that were pretty much the majority of the comments that came in from the public. Uh, one of the big ones that the commissioners agreed with, and this is probably going to be open for debate tonight in this meeting too, is removing loss or drainage from that well and urban interface. The main concern is that the drainage to the west, um, we couldn't really, we couldn't really support just having that ingress, egress, in and out of the loss or drainage, considering the movie. Um, some of the concerns were the sensitive habitat in the area, the wetlands and riparian areas, um, as well as it is proposed wild and scenic. Um, so we just kind of weighed that back and forth. We looked for input from anybody else that had any comment on, on removing or implementing that into the CWPP. Didn't get a whole lot of feedback. So that's kind of the first major proposed, um, I guess, amendment or change to the CWPP. The next one kind of came in a little bit late, but made total sense. It was getting a map of the 13 fire districts implemented or put in the CWPP too. I don't know why that kind of fell through from the beginning. I think it was proposed yeah. earlier on, um, but it just kind of fell through the gaps. 
So that's that's the second one. Um, another another comment that made sense is we did have a lot of to be determined dates on our action plan. Um, it just kind of it, it came up last minute. We didn't really we didn't really see that, but it made sense to at least put hypothetical dates in in those spots, and just so that the public sees that we're making progress and we're moving towards a date. It's not just to be determined and it's going to be put on the shelf at a later date. Try to you know work it out. It's typical of local government anyway. So that that's kind of the third one. Change some of those dates so that we have. You know, not necessarily concrete dates in that action plan, but a little bit more hypothetical um, timelines. The, the fourth one was Kristen proposed this a few weeks back to the core team. Uh, we did get a lot of, of feedback on it, but I, I agree that it, it should be implemented in the CWPP, especially a lot with a lot of litigation and stuff going on. It's, is uh, putting out a countywide social assessment of residents to determine wildfire risk awareness and, and get people's input on what the educational gaps are, what's lacking in the community, what people want, what kind of barriers and pathways for mitigation and action, just kind of an overall um, feedback from the community because we feel that, you know, even though we did have three community meetings on the wildfire protection plan and more of a um, just an informal kind of get to know what a CWPP is, see the maps and a lot's changed. So we do feel that, you know, the county and definitely fire the root council could team up on this partner, Eric Cooper and Jeff Roderick are here to um, kind of talk about a little bit of that too. But I feel that would be important and valuable for the CWPP. Um, and the final, the final suggested edit came from that update. From the outreach committee. Oh, the outreach. The outreach committee, which uh, bridged into the CWPP team. Um, yeah, it was the CWPP team, which yeah, yeah, includes sure. both. I but mean, but there's a lot of the people were the same people. Yeah. Right. And so so that's where that suggestion came from. Do you want to? No, go ahead. You got it right? Do yeah, I have it on there? Is it, it is on there. Is yeah, it it's on there. And I'd have to remember what I wrote if you. So basically what it came down to is just being more specific on the revision and the update for the CWPP moving forward, not just every 10 years so the plan doesn't just sit on a shelf, getting a little more specific and kind of committing more or less to annual reviews. It could be up to the core team or whoever, fire group or whoever um, you feel appropriate to kind of head that, that charge on, on the annual reviews, updating the action tables, um, Kind of going over everything that's happened over the year, where we stand, and that's just would be just an annual review, just a tracking kind of monitoring program. But overall, kind of committing to a, a five year, at least a five year update, where it's it's you know not an overhaul of the CFUPP, but it would be a gathering of the core team again, kind of going through this process and really solidifying some some changes that have been discussed over the years, over that year, or um, you know, more of kind of the, the larger revisions that people would like to see in the CWPT. So. And then triggers too. We have yeah, to get like in case there's changes. The but, yeah. As well, where if, if things, if there are major changes to either the conditions described in the CWPT or the data sets used for the analysis in the CWPT, then if those are substantive enough to change, then, then there'd be a revision of those elements. So that was in the part of the annual review process, along with the bookkeeping of the projects and the and the gathering of comments. Right. So that's, I mean, that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. We have the discussion with the commissioners on the 18th which would likely be whether they decide to sign it or not. The timeline for signing it, some of the discussion is that we do it in 2024, it'll allow the CWPP to extend for another year of grant funding. So if we sign it in 2023, that kind of takes a whole year away that would allow more projects to be completed, more qualifications for funding, so on and so forth. But the 18th of December would be the day that the commissioners will likely review the document, review, review any of the amendments.
is that we decide to put in. They would likely decide to sign it then or postpone till January. That's kind of the next kind of the next big date in the schedule. So in your comments tonight, think of these changes as being part of the current draft. Yes, the current draft. But they're not That's what in I the said current draft. draft. Not as they're well. not, but I would I would because this is not gonna keep happening. Like this night is not gonna keep happening. It right. can't keep happening. Right. You know what planning commission is. I I don't I don't know. It's on the so we uh, we have only a max of like five minutes for questions on what he just talked about. Byron? A question about the so the contractor is going for with these changes currently. We just we just sent them out. So we just proposed to them. We feel that these are not so substantive. Is not large enough that at this moment in time these, we could make these changes without putting the plan back out for public comment. We really want to be transparent in the whole thing. I felt personally, if we make any major changes, it would have to go out for a review period. Mm -hmm. Yes. By the <laughs> a lot of them just aren't that, you know, just showing them out there, anything, especially like the update one. You know, that's yeah, just a little word something. Laura, yeah, I just had a question. Um, on the update, update. Um, <laughs> I don't know. On the plan of review and update change, is there any provision in that for public input? There's public input into the, the whole process. How, and, how did it happen, I guess? Or there... and, and if there's a substantive update, then it'll be on the commissioner's calendar because it'll need to be signed. And so, so it'll have a public review and public participation process there. If it's the, the annual review, and bringing all the projects up to date, you know, marking off the ones that are completed, adding some other ones. No, there's no public process in that, other than through the the all the participants in the CWPP, Byron Root being one of them, if we sign it. And uh, and so so that the nuts and bolts updates there the participants in the process will have have comments and participation and and review and so on and it essentially it will be the, the core team and, and fire and Rip being one member of that if you sign it and uh and then the the major changes whether it's triggered by major changes in data or conditions, would go through the commissioners. And obviously, a five year update would go through the commissioners and have a public review process. So the big ones, yes. The small ones, no. But I suppose I should have just started with the short answer, huh? <laughs> but anybody would be able to go comment on the CWP. I mean, anything that's, that's adopted through River Valley County is open for a public comment, basically. <laughs> Anytime. Yeah. It's not it's not a regulatory document. It doesn't require a hearing, it doesn't require lawyers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you had comment, you can send one into the commission. You know, we got nearly all of the projects that we proposed into the project table. And my guess is that when that comes up a year from now, we'll have a meeting like we had two meetings ago where we go through and, and come up with project ideas and then propose that propose those for the for the next round. So yeah a full update should go through exactly what this process went through. So it will <clears throat> include everything that we've gone through now and we'll be even better at it because we're seasoned professionals now. 
Everybody get their questions answered on that. Just one quick clarification, Silver. So these are the five things that are going to change about the civil engineer. Right. They're definitely the contractor is going to produce new sentences. Those sentences are going to go in there. What is the language of this company going to It still seems you know, what are you going to do? What are you, how are you going to evaluate? Is it, are you going to evaluate the objectives themselves? Are you going to evaluate? I mean, what, what gets monitored? What's the monitoring scheme? What's the funding? Well, I think, I, I think, where's all that? Is that process going to be laid out in the next? It is, it is, it is, and in the action table, part of that is monitoring. I mean, so one of the proposed major actions of CWPP is monitoring progress, monitoring process, and, and having those. And that's going to be written into this evaluation section of the CWPP. Right. right. And when will that, when will that language be available? That's, that's already in there. I mean, it's already uh, in there to accept it to the extent that yeah. what I, we're, what making I, it more what I said, we're making it more specific to in five yeah. years review and making that kind of a commitment of the Valley County and fire in the room and the core team to, to make those revisions and lead that, lead that charge, so to speak. Is that you're wondering when this is going to be open for more public review, the, I'm, the comments? I'm or? wondering when I can. But I'm already seeing probably now. I mean, soon as, soon, as it's, as soon as it's up, I mean, as soon as it's updated, it's going to be open. It's going to be out for public, you know. When will that be? be between now and between now and the eighteenth, when will that be? I can't tell you. As soon as we get it sent off to the commission to, to the contract, it'll be up to that. So it hasn't been. It hasn't out. been. No. Well, it was sent out today, but we haven't. Okay. This stuff takes takes time. This is literally this just literally came uh -huh. up today, sending it out. We were literally just last week able to pull all these comments together. And send them out to the core team for review. Part of it is bringing it up to fire and root tonight for comment and your guys' approval, or that this is part of all the process. So it's not, this isn't a defined, it's going to come out next week or the week after. By the 18th, it has to be solidified into the draft because that's when it's going to be signed. So the short answer is it'll be ready on the 18th at the latest. Right. But it went to the contractor today, so it's not going to be ready tomorrow. Right. right. Okay, we probably need to move on. Okay. So at this point, we need to know how how many people want to make a five minute or less um, presentation, and we need to make that list. And then Kimberly's got a handy dandy system that will put all those names in and hold them in random order and we will go for it. We will try to get everything in in less than an hour. So we know Rick is going to say something. So Rick. Jim. We have two Tims tonight. Okay. Did the other Tim raise his hand in the back? Oh, Steve. I mean, no. okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, okay, Laura. I have my name on there too. Sam, did you want to say? Yep, Sam's raising his hand. Yes, and you don't have to be a voting member to speak. Uh, at the very end, we'll do the votes to the people that are qualified to vote. But anybody can make a comment. It doesn't have to be the best people who can vote. Myron? I'll do a comment too, but I want to make sure everybody gets their time in first. Or correct time. Anybody else? Okay. 
Okay, so we have, I'm going to read the list and if you wanted to speak and I didn't read the name, then raise your hand while. Uh, Rick, Ken, Kim, Steve, Laura, Judy, Frank, Sam, Byron, and Kristen. Anybody else? So right. anybody that can make theirs shorter than five will be great. <laughs> we'll do our best. So well, five minutes of talk is an hour to twelve. So I know that's stand up and sit down time. We're we're good with ten. All right, Laura, well, you are the number one chooser of the randomizer, so you will go first. <laughs> you left me out. I I thought I was down the list. Okay. Um, right. So I want to remind everybody, sorry to interrupt, but just speak very loudly. If you don't think you can project well, maybe come and stand up by me so that Sam can hear. And Joshua, hi Joshua, we have another addition, so sorry. And I will also put you on the clock, so there will be a little chime bell that everybody can hear, and that will be the signal we just, for you, Sam, so. can you hear me okay? Just nod, don't have to unmute. <laughs> All right, Miss Laura, are you ready? You're on the clock. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, most of my suggestions are kind of the result of trying to figure out how to get the best document now, because getting it changed again is going to be, I know, challenging. It's a living document, but that requires a lot of discussion and input. And the point that came up for me most was hearing repeatedly, this is not a regulatory document, but the sort of assumption therefore was that we don't have any leverage. And I think that that's not true. I think there are a number of ways we can leverage from this document where specifically other organizations are going to list us as a reason they can get funds. And there's funding out there which requires a CWPP or some similar collaborative entity. And based on that, there were a couple, several things I thought we should include in the draft and in the final document. And Kristen printed this out if you want to look at it later, but basically the first one is that every project, which, well, this applies every project that cites the CWPP as part of its justification or doing the work or getting the money should include these guidelines for those projects. So that, you know, someone can't say, well, we want to um, plant roses down the center of Hamilton. Uh, that wouldn't qualify if, if they listed the CWPP as a support item in their project funding request or actual request. And I came up with five things that I think should be stated clearly that any entity referencing the CWPP as justifying their project or funding request should include. The first one is they will clearly show that they are in accordance with current scientific consensus, roses would not qualify, and then simply quote our mission statement at Byron, uh, which is promote and facilitate long-term reduction of fire risk from a risk from wildfire and adaptation to fire uh, to wildfire by communities. So it's the, basically the Fire and the Council mission statement. If they're going to use us, they should make sure that their project is in line with our mission statement. And I just quoted it. Um, the second one is a sort of a follow up of that that we should be science based, that any project that names uh, the uh, CWPP should actually contain funding for on the ground data collection before the project starts. So that we'll know what the beginning was and that a part of that project funding will be held in reserve for follow-up monitoring. And this will give us local data on what worked or didn't work. And I think that's a reasonable request. If they're going to use the CWPP, that's feedback that would be long-term useful. 
in terms of what the fire removal would be. Now, these are amendments that I'm suggesting fire removal requests, not my personal election, but that we have scientific monitoring required if they're going to name the CWPP as a support entity that qualifies them for funds or projects. Uh, the next one, which is a little sort of another step from that science, is that they not doing anything that will preclude further action that could reduce fire. And the example I'm going to give is just one small one, but I think it's a typical one. There's data out there from peer-reviewed science now that says that undisturbed habitats have not been treated burn less intensely than treated habitats. This isn't just a woo thing. I can give you the reference to the 2016 paper that states this. Laura, you have to take it back. Thanks. So the projects that follow or depend on the CWPP should not include things that will make fire reduction less effective as science changes and evolves. And one of the things that seems to come under that head specifically is not to disturb mature and native habitats. That was the third item. Stop there. Thank you, Laura. And we do have Laura's full comments printed out. So that you can pick yep, up afterwards. The yeah. We'll put them over here on this table. I don't know if we had enough for it. So I managed to get one out of my picture. So. <laughs> Byron, you are up next in the queue of the randomizer. <laughs> it's a whole lot of time. Basically, uh, the comment that came in that you mm -hmm. referred to, uh, probably the one that uh, I'm most against, but again, I could go either way on it, is the lost forest drainage. And the reason I say that is uh, mainly because lost forest drainage uh, has a lot of ecological value, uh, the habitat, and just, just about anything, because it's wild scenic uh, order. Uh, I think uh, it's important to protect that for sure. Uh, but the thing that comes to my mind, and I've spent a lot of time in fire, uh, and what I've seen is those corridors like that, that's a one way in, one way out. That is a very valuable uh, area for tourists during the fire season. And they love that corridor. They go up, they recreate, they fish, they do whatever they do. Uh, up there. And I think, uh, you know, from a fire standpoint, it's certainly not wooly, but it's an important corridor because of the people that are using that corridor during the height of the fire season. And in my career, uh, it's very important to protect those people. Anytime we had uh, a fire in the wilderness, to say, when I was on the Stillwater Minister, uh, if we had a fire that was going in the wilderness, we always flew it and tried to identify who's in there from the trailheads, where they go. They're supposed to sign in, but not everybody does. Uh, the main point being, uh, you know, you, you've got to protect those people in, in that event. And yes, it's their choice to be in there. I understand all that, but it's our choice and our duty to protect those people. And that corridor has a lot of people in it over uh, over the summer period, doing a lot of different things. And so it's important for us to protect those people. So again, yeah, I agree, it's not wooly, but it's an, it's an important corridor. Just like the corridors over in Scalpahoe that go to the East Fork, those are still in. Well, the reason they're in is because of evacuation of some of those homes up in uh, Rye Creek and some of those places that need another way out. 
And of course, the lost horse doesn't have another way out unless you go up over the hill to Como. Uh, so, uh, but if they're way up in there, they're, they're trapped. So that's my take on lost horse training. The other thing I want to bring up is, uh, uh, well, I've been a part of the BWPP process since 2003. And, you know, the CWPP is really, really important. And again, it's not regulatory, but it's advice, it's a guideline for people to understand what's important in this salad, what's at risk in this salad. So I think, uh, I think in terms of the process we went through uh, for the past year, uh, is the best process I've been through. I've been through the 2004, 5, 6, and 9 CWPP. Uh, and this is by far the best process that I've been involved with. Because look at all the people that are so interested in this. And so I'm going to back up a little bit and just say, uh, just like it's been said many times, is this is an evolving process over time, every year. So I think it's important for us to keep that in mind. And I guess, you know, I think a lot of good work has been done uh, by our contractors, by us. And I think we need to hold course and raise your hand to get the CWPP signed. I think it's really important for this hour. Thank you. Could I just clarify something about what we're doing here? This is about whether or not we are going to sign the CWPP recommend it for signature. And so maybe at the end of each statement, we need to say, I, I think I am for signing out or I am not. So I'm unclear on what it, it as it currently exists. Okay, I am not for signing. Okay. I think it needs further. Okay. And Byron, you were for signing. Yeah. Okay. All right. In the randomizer, we have Sam. <laughs> Did you tag me, Judy? No, <laughs> I didn't. I'm unmuted to join us, Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this really quick because you know I'm not voting, but you know um, some um, ideas I had. Uh, thanks to Byron and um, Laura, they had good points. Laura, I like the data collection ahead of time, and uh, photo documentation would be great. Um, I think the content's solid. So, I, you know, I, I think I'm right there with Byron and probably many of you that this needs to be signed, recognizing it's evolving in a year. Um, there will be a, um, an update, whether it's minor or major, but definitely in five years, a major update. And uh, going along, tagging with that greater specificity. I mean, the tools and the data are right there right now. And so I'm not quite sure how this plays into the mix, but in my mind, I don't know if there's a cohesive management plan for the whole valley for fighting fire. And I think that the potential is there to get the districts together with the county and the Forest Service to really have a coordinated um, pre-packaged data set that will work to fight fire and tagging to the CWPP. That's not for this version. This version, you know, in my mind, it's more approval. You know, and I had sent an email to Kristen with some suggestions and she shared it, I think. And, you know, I mean, there's some simple things. Review the link, make sure the links work. You know, some of the maps, I wasn't crazy about the risk to potential structures. I probably uh, definitely add in a transportation map and there are a couple others I'd add in. The standard scale, it seems like reference scale for the maps are like one inch equals 10 miles, I think. Um, you, you know, in future versions, you might want to alter that a bit and really be upfront and reflecting on the specificity, especially with the, the, so the urban areas for those small communities. And, you know, realizing small communities, uh, the communities up and 
all along Route 93 can potentially be in, impacted by a wildfire, given the weather conditions, which are so anom anomalous right now. You really can't predict what they're going to do. And the, the time frame, the the sort of time period that you have to react to fast moving wildfires. I, I'm really worried that not only here, but in other areas that, you know, we're looking at, you know, serious situations where we can't move fast enough. And that's critical. And that's why I think you should have a transportation map in there or that next iteration in five years with greater specificity, you need to incorporate that in too. Um, Thanks, um, Ken. You know, you had mentioned about the changes for data and condi conditions. You know, I think that's important to note that definitely the conditions will change. My family, they, you know, a year ago we were hearing the smoke was so bad. And then this year it was like, great, nobody visited <laughs> in the summer. So um, anyway, um, but I think, you know, the important thing is to get this approved. And, uh, you know, I think you guys did a super job. And um, thanks to Kristen and everybody else. Um, so I, that's all I really have to say. I mean, I have some minor things, but, you know, I mean, you can pick it apart. But the content's there. And I, I would have, I probably would have ran the whole document through sort of Microsoft Word to create a, uh, I would have liked a little bit different outline or document structure, but that's no big deal. The next iteration, you can solve that. But anyway, thanks. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Now, yep. can Sam vote? Well, we agreed last Was it one, in person? had to be in person. Okay. So. All right. He that's again. fine. I just wanted that's, to clarify and make sure. That's fine. Hey, thanks. Yeah. You don't have your feelings hurt, right? She asked if you had your feelings hurt. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah, by the way, it's snowing here. Just so you know, the weather is pretty similar to where you are. And I was oh, coated with snow degrees. earlier. Oh. Okay. All right. So, Thanks, randomizer Sam. has Tim up next. Thank you. Um, my name is Tim Antark. I have uh, three years here in the Bitterroot Valley, but previously I spent most of the fire scars on these hillsides up there. I participated in and uh, retired forest service. But I, uh, as a professional forest forester, I came initially to a couple of the meetings as, as you guys were getting started, and I had some previous commitments on Tuesday nights, so I, I couldn't participate. But my take on, after sitting and going through page by page, particularly the maps and et cetera, this team did an excellent job. I just, it's easy for me to track, although some of the stuff, all the fuel models and stuff are way beyond me anymore. But, uh, but uh, I just, yeah, I found this easy to track. I particularly like the maps. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see them be larger. Um, it, it'd be easier for old people to see. And then, uh, but, and, and for tracking, but I, I just think, I mean, you can enlarge the maps any, with any, any printing, but, but I, I just re highly recommend that it get signed. And I, and I just commend you guys for what you did because I think it's an excellent document. And then I had just one thought on Lost Horse. It's an afterthought, but uh, I've only been up Lost Horse since I've been here, I think three times. The bottom part of it has the number of homes in it. And but as you get, work your way towards the National Forest. My background is a, a couple degrees in forestry, including a master's degree in forest and range geology. And my, all the years that, that I worked in fire suppression, my eye goes immediately to the forest types. What's there and what used to be there, historically what those forests look like. Lost Trail, you can say what you want, Wildlife corridors, you can talk about wild and scenic corridors, but I want you to remember Mother Nature always bats last, but she will change that corridor. It's a ticking time bomb. Thank you. Ken. All right. So I'm going to violate one of the rules here and not <laughs> and not have any eyes focus. So I'm gonna talk about we and I'm gonna and I'm gonna walk us through the last couple of years and what we have done. So a couple of years ago we met in the same room about this time of year 
we uh, we're finalizing the description of what we are. You know, the, what's first? You know, what came up with the you know, and boy, the wordsmithing that was a painful process, and so <laughs> and so was the mission statement, and that's what we were doing. Yeah, and and we were all in agreement that the 2006 plan was way out of date and not going to work. And, uh, and was really important to serve our mission and to achieve our mission. And we wanted to do a couple of things. Um, we decided that we needed a letter of support from the town commissioners. And if we didn't have that, we ran the risk of, well, first of all, we needed it to put in for the grants to, to fund a, an update process. But we also didn't want a high center at the other end of it like we did in 2009. So we wanted a letter of support that said, yep, we're on board. Because we already had the backing of all the fire chiefs. Well, everybody else, except the commissioners were on board. So, um, so March 10th, well, then we spent two months getting that presentation together as you guys would all recall. And we had many versions of it. I looked at my computer for the, to bring it so we could have a one slide thing up there. And that, and we went through four meetings, four versions of it. The wordsmith it and picture smith it. So anyway, Byron and I presented that with many of you present to the commissioners. And the bottom line up front, and I'll just read you that off of our second slide so you know and I'll have this, uh, what we presented to the commissioners, I'll put out as a handout. So those of you who want to refresh your memories, or, which is always a good idea for me. Um, but the bottom line up front, 2006 CWPP is out of date and in need of an update to reflect current conditions. Two, Fire and Root Council intends to update the 2006 plan and has widespread support including nearly all the entities that signed the plan. Grant funding is potentially available in 2022 to provide financial resources to facilitate the update, but it requires local support, including the Valley County Commission. The county will be real competitive for these grants is the best of that, that part. Um, so we're here to provide background information on Fire and Root Council, one, Community Wildfire Protection Plan characteristics, benefits, and requirements. They're all in this, in this handout. And three, request a letter of support to the commission from the commission. So we got that letter. And uh, we then joined our interagency partners, applied for a grant. When uh, we won the grant, and contracted for updating the CWPP. Thanks to Drew for wrangling that uh, contract all the way through the process, including sending off stuff today to, for changes, something like being under the wire. Um, so we got that grant. We fully participated in the process and the update. Nearly all of our project proposals were accepted and included in the, in the uh, projects to be done. And, uh, and that brings us to now. And it's inconceivable of, of, to me that the group that initiated the process wrangled the county commissioners into supporting it and all of the previous signers let the grant and participated all the way through the process are now contemplating doing what, the, what we were so critical of the county commission doing in 2009. Oh, we're not going to sign it. It's a nice plan, but we're not going to sign it. So there's my, there's there's my cue. <laughs> I guess I don't really need to say I'm <laughs> in full support of signing it now. And staying at the table because if we don't sign it, we're not going to be at the table. We're not going to have our 
Thank you. All right. And I have our seat at the table. Next in the randomizer is Rick. Hey, can you turn the projector on? So uh, there's some uh, copies of my slides. Uh, can you turn the lights on? Yeah. Yeah, and I'll let it pull up before you start, right? So that there's some copies of my slides. Chris, and then I'm going to turn on. What's that? Everybody uh, has to leave the room. There's no way to Because they're automatic. Like, yeah. So if anything yeah. moves, they come back. Do you have it on the jump drive? I can put it on. I can put it on this computer. Oh, oh wait. Okay, don't move. Don't move. Nobody oh, okay. move. <laughs> Sorry, Sam, you're stuck with seeing a lot of me, probably. You want a 30 second warning before your time goes up? I need to reset. I was going to reset this. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. It's gonna keep happening, right? Sorry, Sam. You're not not be able to see this. Problem. Actually, I can use the mics. When I did get your other comment in the chat. Thanks, Krista. Oh, sorry, I'm moving. That's okay. Tim, don't move. <laughs> Ready? Okay, we're driving. All right, let's try this. Okay, so let's just uh, let's just get started here. All right, um, you all uh, you all know me. There's some um, these slides are available, generally speaking, uh, throughout the room. Um, so I'm going to just start off here. I'm the one that kind of started this whole process, and so I'm going to start off here with our with our mission statement. Mission statements across the top. I've reformatted this for clarity, and so our mission is to promote and facilitate two things, long-term long -term reduction of risk from wildfire and adaptation to wildfire by communities uh, and residents throughout Valley County. Mostly I'm gonna be focusing on item one, risk reduction long-term. So risk, why are we experiencing higher uh, risk of catastrophic wildfire? That's why we're here. Well. We've got Byron here, we've got uh, Tim, lots of firefighters in the room. Fuel, heat, air, remove uh, any one of them and the fire goes out. We used to joke that you would have to add overhead into that too. So if you get rid of the overhead team, the fire will go out. Well. <laughs> but uh, but so, so, so extreme fuel loads on state federally managed uh, forests, that's where the fuel component of this comes in. Extreme temperatures, heat, and the associated drought, lack of water, cross Bitterroot and global landscapes. Extreme wind, i.e. air, uh, across Bitterroot and, uh, and global landscapes. And so risk reduction, so to reduce risk, we need to require, we require a clear understanding of the drivers of risk. And so on the fuel side, I think we all agree on this. I don't know for sure. But a century of aggressively excluding natural fire from ecosystems of state and federal landscapes managed by state and federal agencies have result, resulted in these dangerous fuel loads. Key, century of fossil chemical combustion and fossil chemical agriculture. We don't talk about so much about the role of agriculture and climate change, but those are the two big drivers of this have dramatically altered the thermodynamic properties of the global e ecosphere in terms of heat. And so that, again, fuel, heat, air, and those same conditions, fossil fuel combustion, chemical agriculture, have also altered another important thermodynamic property of the ecosphere, entropy. This is the, this is the likelihood of extreme events happening. And so that is where high winds and air comes in. This is why we have this risk. These are the two primary drivers of this risk. So this brings us to the Healthy Forest Restoration Act. And so we talk a lot about the, uh, HEPRA in the CWPP, 
but nowhere in the CWPP can you find the actual purpose of HEFRA written out. And so HEFRA has six purposes. Purpose one, reduce risk of wildfire through collaborative processes of planning, prioritizing, and implementing hazardous fuels reduction programs. That's where the CWPP requirements come from, from purpose one. There are other purposes here to protect, water, uh, to protect watersheds, threats to, for threats to forest and rangeland health, promote systematic gathering of information, forest and rangeland health again comes up, to protect and restore enhanced forest ecosystem components, promote recovery of threatened species, improve biological diversity, and and uh, and increase productivity and carbon sequestration. All of these are very implicitly talking about anthropogenic climate change. Um, the national the NCS also goes into this, um, talks about intensifying wildfire conditions, and gets into climate change. And in all of these, in both of these systems, they're talking about about carbon sequestration, the impact of, and the impact of anthrop uh, anthropogenic climate change. The current CWPP fails to incorporate basic available science because it doesn't deny, it doesn't identify the historic management of forest ecology, mismanagement, fails to identify anthropogenic as being a driver of this. Absent proper definition of these parameters, Long-term risk reduction is unlikely, uh, fails in a number of other ways, and you can look up uh, in my comments what these, what these other failures, systematic information gather, gathering. There's really no meaningful methodology for updating this. And I suggest one simple edit at the very beginning of the, of the program, uh, and it's this edit. So the first paragraph that you see on page two, section 1.1, this is what I would suggest as a replacement for that and would address the actual risk uh, uh, that we're, that, that our mission statement is geared toward. And, and, so, and so I am uh, uh, advocating we do not sign this uh, until these issues are resolved within the current plan. All and right. You have copies that you put out for people to pick up. I have a uh, few copies. There's seven. CB, you are up. Start timer yet? I will start when you are wanting to start. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Ready. Good evening. I think I know most of you. For those of you that I haven't met, I'm Steve Brown. I'm the district ranger in Stevensville, the Blue National Forest, for the remainder of the month. And then I'll be moving down to Dark. Steve, so I'm going to be the Blue Ranger for the um, First off, thank you guys for all your efforts. I know what it takes to see a long project through and to come to consensus on just about anything. And it's impressive that you could be start where you did with, you know, hey, let's do this and let's develop a mission statement and produce a document like that. So I appreciate all the the passion and dedication and everything that it takes to do that. So thank you. Like Tim, I had a standing Tuesday conflict or else I would have been here. So I appreciate you guys doing it in my stead. My one comment though, we talk about risk a lot in this document. And I think that the idea of risk is somewhat conflated with hazard. Because the way the Forest Service defines risk, it's a function of hazard and probability. And so risk takes those two things. You know, what, what is the hazard? The hazard in this case is impact to private lands and private structures. Well, what's the likelihood of that happening? You combine that hazard with the risk or the hazard with the probability, and you know what the risk is. So if we look at a fire, we have lost it. That's come up a few times. Pretty low risk that a fire at the head of the drainage is going to come out and impact private land. Why do we know that? Well, because we have a quantified wildfire risk assessment 
that's done 50,000 simulations of fire starts on every pixel with multiple weather patterns to determine how often will that fire, if it escapes initial attack, impact private land. And we know with a pretty high degree of certainty that if a fire starts, say, at the mouth of Lost Horse, it's 90 to 100% likely to impact private land. If it starts way back in the wilderness, maybe it's 20 percent. But we quantify that. And my concern is out of I've heard it mentioned here this evening that people will use this buoy map to either justify a project or put in for grant money. So I'm going to name the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is the Forest Service will use this this buoy layer to justify doing some work. We're getting some money to do some work, possibly, but we haven't had a wooey layer in my time here, and we haven't used the wooey layer to justify getting any money or justify doing any work. What we have used is the quantified wildfire risk assessment, which shows us with a high degree of certainty if a fire escapes initial attack, will it impact private land? And that's where we focus our treatments. And so I think the wooey layer as it stands doesn't adequately capture the risk. You know, I think that the work you guys have put into this has been great, but that last set section of maps to me, kind of like, ooh, it's got dialed way back in it. You know, if the idea is to represent the risk to the community, it really doesn't represent the risk to the community. So my recommendation would be to, to utilize, you know, whether it's a 50% cutoff, a 60% cutoff, you know, that's where you can have your debate. But the data is there. Sam talked about the data. Ken talked a bit about the data. Twenty. Ken hired me into the Forest Service twenty some odd years ago. <laughs> and when he left, I took his job, and I stayed there for sixteen years. And when I left, Sam took my job. <laughs> it's a small world. Uh, but that's really my concern: is we we've got strong, defensible data that's utilized not just across this forest, but across the nation that demonstrates the true risk. And so I would recommend that you incorporate that in there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's easier to read, it's easier to look around on PM call. Um, well, first off, I want to I want to preface it by saying I've been here for what I think this is over two years now, or whatever it is, long time. We've all worked hard, we've all been involved with this, and we've all invested in it. And you know, I thank Byron and I and I kid him a lot, obviously. Years ago, came out to my place and because I have land and I wanted to make sure. And I did an HIZ around my place and and thin my place. So I, none of that is 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 alien to me or difficult for me to to accept. The CWPP is is not regulatory, and I agree, but it has a lot of influence. It has a lot of weight, and and I'm just talking about really the psychology of it. Okay. So when you look at something, I don't think it's easy to just kind of pass it off. I'm going to continue on. Obviously, everybody, I think, is aware that Laura and I are good friends and work at, and had a lot of time together. I'm going to finish what she has to say of her five points first. I want to say that pretty quickly. But I, but she had five points that she wanted to bring up, and I'm going to, I'm going to address the last two first. Of all. And she says that projects will not remove mature trees or disturb existing mature native habitats until it is proved that increasing atmospheric carbon is not contributing to climate change that is worsening our fire risk. And I think that's a, I'll, I'll come back to this in a minute. Young trees emit carbon. Mature trees over 25 to 40 years, depending on species, absorb atmospheric carbon, storing it in their limbs and the surrounding soil 
most successfully if the surrounding understory and soils haven't been disturbed, compacted by heavy machinery. I'm, I'm, I really want to emphasize this because we can't separate what's happening to the climate and fire any way you want to look at it right now. They're, they're married. And you have to actually look at the history for the last 20 years, and you can't help but recognize that the climate and the fire are going hand in glove in, in the direction that we are not comfortable with. Also, in the in the in the uh, in the CWPP is that there's no mention in the draft update of how our local climate has changed and is expected to change further in ways that exacerbate wildfires and the risk. Independent of what is the cause of climate change, failure to note this factual climate change trajectory is a serious omission in our CWPP update that needs to be amended. I can't emphasize that enough. So I spoke with a friend of, of Ken's also, who remembers you very fond, very nicely, by the way. Uh, spoke to him quite a bit. Named Andy Hudak. And, uh, and I think Ken would back me in saying that he's a pretty well-established scientist in, the, in fire and fire behavior. And he says, one of the first things you said, Frank, he says it's complicated. There is. There is nothing simple about fire, and there's nothing simple about how you're going to manage fire. Okay. He sent me a, I have so much information here, I, I, I don't even want to get into it too much. But I, I decided I would say, and I just decided when I was talking up here, is that there's a factor, I'm, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm not, a, I, I fought fires before I went to the Army. I fought fire, I fought fires in the Army, but different kind of fire. And I fought fires after the Army. I was a health factor. So I'm not ignorant to fires, but I'm even more aware of human behavior. I'm aware that we like the simplest answer to our life. We like things to go easy. We like to have an answer. And we want it clear and we want it simple. And our world is not. We have, in my, in my arena, in my field, what's called complexity, uh, uh, complexity avoidance. People do not like complexity. You don't want complexity here. This is not simple. There's nothing simple about what we're talking about. And I think it's essential. Everything I read in, in the research talks about how every, oh, oh, 30 seconds. Okay. Complexity, we have to, I think it's essential that we start embracing it. I don't feel that the CWPP right now is doing justice to that. Well, it hasn't ranked yet. No, go on. I'll your 30-second one. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Ten I, I'll give it a death. <laughs> so <laughs> the bottom line is you do I don't not feel like the CWPP it. has addressed the things that, I, I really like, I'm glad you put that up there. I didn't see that. I really like that. I would love to see that on there. That would be, I don't, I don't trust when you're in five year things. I don't trust them at all. So no on signing, Frank? That, your stance? He does not or, recommend signing. Okay. Right? It's a tough one. For most oh, really tough. But yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to say that because I think it's essential that we stand up for a greater uh, greater uh, potential than what we're standing up for. Okay. All right, Ms. Judy. I'm going to have written mine and I'm going to read it so that I stay under five minutes. And I guess I will try to point we can, this we way. can probably hear where you are. Okay. I strongly support endorsing the CWPP. Our council mission is to promote and facilitate the long-term reduction of risk from wildfire and adaptation to wildfire by communities and residents throughout the Valley County. To those who have increasingly vilified the Forest Service about their alleged failures, I think it's past time to check whether what you say is constructive or respectful. These are intelligent, caring community members with good motives who are partnering with us and listening to our concerns. Let's not forget they have a mandate to accomplish fuel reduction here in the Bitterroot. 
to reduce our wildfire risk. This council is not about stopping that mandate. I don't need to defend the Forest Service, but what they plan to do makes sense to me, and I will trust it until I see reason to disagree. They may not have communicated in detail exactly what science they are relying on to make their decisions about specific projects, but that does not mean they aren't using the best and most appropriate science available. Scientists as a whole don't and won't agree about climate causes and solutions or forestry management. This council has no authority to debate and decide which science is appropriate for every given circumstance. Science by nature will never be settled and science does not tell you how to use scientific knowledge. I identify as a climate skeptic. I'm inclined to believe the 1,609 scientists, and maybe it's more now, and professors worldwide who signed a no climate <coughs> emergency declaration. It was issued by climate intelligence, clientele is their name. They are a nonpartisan, self-funded, independent organization of scholars whose only agenda is to generate knowledge and understanding of the causes and effects of climate change and climate policy. Not that it matters one bit what I think about current climate issues, but I do know that nobody understands all the complexities involved. Certainly we should do a better job of stewarding the environment, but I don't think we are at an existential crisis point requiring seemingly panic-stricken solutions that don't appear workable or affordable. There is mounting evidence that net zero carbon emissions is not achievable. We do a pretty poor job of forecasting current weather, and I understand the majority of modeling for future climate change does not even account for cloud cover having an impact on temperature. I also cannot reconcile why CO2 is now considered poison when people, plants, and trees need it to live. I'm hearing too much that just doesn't make sense to me. Climate panic is big business. I'm extremely suspicious of fear tactics that are driving a lot of the climate panic narrative. I respectfully and without malice suggest that those who have the great passion for focusing on climate issues should continue their work, but do so outside of our council and team meetings. We simply are not a climate group, and it's not our mission to solve climate issues. My hope is that the local climate action group will be a more appropriate forum for developing specific and positive alternatives that can be presented directly to the Forest Service and anybody else who might have authority to pursue climate issues. This would be a far more positive approach. I have sincerely appreciated the way Laura has framed her questions and her willingness to learn rather than forcefully impose her perspective and hope she can find a less frustrating context with others who have time to devote to pursue these interests. Laura's dedication has inspired me to be more open to learning about climate issues and I'm now reading a climate newsletter and linking to new resources of information. Can we please finish what I believe at least 95% of us want to do and support the city? <laughs> All right, then, as requested, Kristen asked to go. Wow. Well, and I would like to do comments, but I don't want to steal question time too. So I guess I'll put it to everybody. Um, does anybody have a hard stop at 8.30 or can we go till... It was 8.25, I think. Yeah. So can we go till a little bit after if there's questions? Because I will take, forego my comments to do questions. To do oh, yeah. We have to vote too. I didn't even think about that. So I'm going to put it out there. Are we okay going to possibly get recording? Okay, thumbs. Okay, all right. I'll try to read that. Um, so 
as a DNRC representative that is following my agency directives, but also as a founding member of this council, I strongly support the council signing the CWPP as a committed and willing partner because the CWPP supports our mission. When we were putting this council together, we set out to, to gather all the stakeholders that we could that had their fingers in wildfire risk and wanted to have a voice in that mitigation of that risk. And we also asked them to be willing to collaborate, to work together to help Bitterroot residents and the communities in the Bitterroot reduce their risk from wildfire. The most difficult but important part of this is that collaborative piece multiple interests working together towards a common goal. Collaboration requires compromise. Moving forward from disagreement to collective action requires compromise. For this council, that two-pronged common goal is the reduction of wildfire risk and adaptation to wildfire by communities and residents. That is our goal. Recent input to include in the CWPP phrases such as anthropogenic climate change or increase the discussion of climate change or impose scientific requirements on projects listed in the CWPP are valid comments, great comments. But I don't feel they're imperative to this council's goal. They will not directly further our goal of reducing wildfire risk and creating fire adapted communities through the CWPP. The CWPP is not the venue to do this. It is an operational plan. It is not a policy driven plan or it is not a policy oriented plan. They might, oh, th these, these comments and this push actually could do the reverse. Because if we make these demands again with no avenue of compromise, or if we choose not to sign the CWPP as presented because it doesn't address them to our liking, then we will remove ourselves as a partner in reducing wildfire risk in Ravalli County. We will remove ourselves as a player at the table and a driver in all of the wonderful projects that we have included on the action list. Please remember this. We will take ourselves away from the table. I do not agree with everything included or not included in that document, but it is a product of collaboration. And we, and most importantly, our residents and communities will be further ahead in addressing wildfire risk in this county with this document and the county's support and the action list it details than without this document and the county's support. The CWPP has brought the commissioners on board and they are an active partner. They are not, and there are not just fuels projects identified for action, but also ones addressing HIZ and structural ignition, smoke management, evacuation, post-fire recovery, and education and outreach. Supporting the CWPP is not selling our soul for dollars or board fee cuts. It is moving the county a step forward through compromise and collaboration and will allow us to design and implement projects with partner support to get work done on the ground. It will also provide funding for the coordination of our council. Our signature or lack of signature on this document will not keep it from being implemented, but it will have immense repercussions for our council's credibility. Since environmental impact and long-term risk is a concern for many of us, I want to reiterate that as we create fire adapted communities that can withstand the occurrence of fire, that will allow for better management of our forest resources for their health, resilience, and preservation at a larger scale to occur. This is the specific goal that Dr. Jack Cohen espouses. Managing the human factor will allow for better environmental stewardship 
that includes fire used in its historic role at a landscape level. Good timing. Good timing. Good timing. Good timing. <laughs> Very good. So if you have that listed, we can vote what it is right here. The green. It's on the table too. And those are light balance. So, yes. Pardon? Oh, yeah, some good questions. I was just curious um, for the um, introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My name is Julia Murphy. I'm with the Heritage Program Manager for the Meaners. So I have the Instagram that has supported this event with the And um, you know, obviously, that's a lot of the results and the various pros and the things. But I did just want to ask a follow up question for the. Um, Science cited by Laura and um, Laura for that. You had said that data for underserved habitats is often under, um, is at less risk for wildfire. Less severe. Less severe wildfire. And so I was wondering, is, did that, within that study, was that for like a specific severity of Within, because oftentimes, you know, on a like high severity of day or something, it's just really accurate. I think it. I'd have to go back and look quite honestly. It was just a long table yeah. with lots of graphs from 2016. But its conclusion was that what they did was compare fire severities in untreated areas, like in the wilderness areas, but they're very difficult to treat. And they said, this is what the data shows. So that was, I found, yeah, it, it put questions into. The only thing I want to point, and I know this isn't in the case, but I just like in the in the realm of heavy industrial areas, I do know that a lot of times that is true on the lower end severity, like low to middle severity, like if it's you know not the conditions that lead to what we often call the mega fires, but the problem is those are all pretty big and most successful versus those days that are often. Being more and more frequent the the need for more of 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 the need for more very important from a human protection and honestly from a person's because yes, old and mature trees do remain larger than that. The forest obviously has a huge So I just wanted to point that out because I have read some of that data as well, and it is true, but the problem is it's sometimes true for the data that we already do. I just wanted to say that as well. No, like in the, in the vein of Yeah, and I, I mean, I did just give that as one example, quite honestly. I mean, what I want, what I was advocating, it's quite tr tricky, is there is a CWP almost there that I think would be perfect. And, you know, the things that I'm pushing for in order for me to be supportive of it, which right. aren't there, and I think. In that statement, just was best available science. And you give out my example, that would make a big difference. More emphasis. That would start relearning, which is going to change. I mean, five years from now, the HIZ may be irrelevant. Just, you know, these are changing targets. But we appreciate you're in a tough spot, Laura. <laughs> really tough spot. It just is, yeah. And there's no way to adjust the vote to know right. what we're going to have. Right. So uh, Kimberly's going to come around and collect the votes, and she will count them. So those of you, raise your hand if you have your vote completed so she can pick it up. Hey, so yes I... means supporting oh. yes. signing. Yes. I wanted to mention that this will be Andrew's last meeting with us 
Everybody throw tomatoes and eggs. And <laughs> so Andrew is moving to um, Helena at the end of the month with a new position with FWP. They are lucky to have him, and he will be sorely missed because he has been a really solid partner for this council. And I know for the DNRC, we really value his his partnership. So make sure to to. Uh, to give him congratulations on his way out. him so that he has to I, move to Helena. I know. <laughs> we chased him away. Well, you, yeah. I want to say, too, it's been absolutely incredible seeing two years ago, as everybody's mentioned, coming in since the process of this organization go from what it was to what it is now. It's been absolutely incredible. So keep up the good work. Do I have everybody's ballots that was handed out of ballot? And while she's counting, we will remind you that there is no meeting in January. Oh, Mike, you have something. Well, since there's no meeting in January, we have the home expo and building show coming up yep. the second and third of February. Is the oh, is that soon? We, yeah, we're going to, the outreach team is going to try and meet early January to discuss whether we're going to do it because we have said we would do it in 2024, but we also need that support to attend it. So we've got to make sure we've got that. Yeah. I may not make the outreach again because of my work schedule. Uh, that, that's one of the problems that it's down to two of us running the office. Mm -hmm. But uh, the realtor board will be there. And we will support as far as handouts if you don't make it. Okay. okay. So you're a backup if you need it. Okay. Uh, I want to let you know that. You, yeah. You, and I can your contact with that and get stuff. Would you send it? Have they already sent out a request for vendors? Because uh, I haven't received We just anything. turned our application and uh, check in today. Uh, get, uh, get a hold of Angela for ready to go. Okay. All right. <laughs> So we'll put this. How about if we put all the extra comments that you want to allow people to take on this table in the front? Here are the twenty copies of the handouts from uh, from the commissioners meeting. This is the slide that Byron and I presented. So Byron and I come. Do you remember the bayon? Did she count? She's counting. Oh, he's probably uh, there. Yeah, they're, they're, they are okay. out. Yeah, on the end. They're over there. These are rigs. These are pins. I was going to say, we actually don't do Robert's rules. So it would be a majority vote. So okay. if he wants to do that, but I. Yeah. yeah. Just do know that all of the concerns that have been raised continually have been voiced through the team. Like it is not that Ken and I and Eurista and Andrew don't carry and mayor, everything and, and they are right, that we haven't all carried it forward when i was stressing compromise i was doing so with a purpose saying 
these comments have all been put forth and the product is what it is. So please do realize you have been represented as part of the council. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Yeah, thank you everyone. And have fun in January. We'll see you. what's the February meeting. February sixth. Yeah. February sixth.